Hello and welcome to a NetIQ Aegis workflow demonstration. My name is David Neufeld, Senior Consultant at NetIQ Professional Services. And in this presentation, we'd like to look at working with SQL data and user input forms, handy ways to process SQL data and return t data back to SQL. The overview of what we'll present here is the key activities that will be used in the workflow the scenario and use case context for the demonstration so you understand what this data is a little bit. Then we're going to move into the operations console, the web interface for Aegis, to look at uh, views and how input form prompts work, especially in new, newer version 3.2, which is quite different from the previous interface. We're going to run the workflow, generate a work item, and look at the flow of operations so we see an end user's perspective first on the workflow. We'll look at some of the activity outputs and also the supporting analysis which allows us to look at some of the table data that gets generated in the course of SQL activities. We'll then switch to the configuration console, look at creating some global settings which are uh, global parameters that can be used in Input Builder inside the workflow. And then in the workflow designer we're going to look at the workflow itself deconstruct some of the key activities that have been used to process the data, look at how those are configured. We'll look at the user input forms. We have dynamic menus created from SQL data and also SQL table records placed in an input form and how we can make those editable. SQL query execution, we want to look at the SQL activities themselves for either just querying data records or making updates to tables as well as executing a stored procedure. One of the ways to process SQL table records is to loop through and process each record. So we'll look at the loop that we use for that, a for each loop. And also look at the supporting analysis configuration on the back side in the workflow. The key activities that will allow us to do this, along with some other generic ones that you've probably seen in Aegis already, the SQL activity is in the external execution library called Execute SQL Commands and Scripts. And you can see the icon on this page. Obviously, we can rename the activities that we use in a workflow to be better descriptive of their actual usage in a given workflow. And the names have been changed in the workflow that we'll look at. But these are the initial names when you're dragging the activities in the workflow designer. Next activity we'll see in the email and user interaction library is the collect input from user. This is your standard input form activity. In the basic workflow control library, we have a for each table row. There are actually several for each uh, looping activities. We'll use the one that deals with table rows, a very convenient way to process the SQL table records. Also a no operation activity. It does exactly what it says. It does not perform any activities, but it is very useful to put into the workflow to visually show where things are flowing in a workflow, and the icon can be changed for different types of purposes. So we'll see that as well. Finally, in the data manipulation library, we have a search table for value activity that lets us go in and search for a value in a particular column or cell in a table and pull up a set one or more records from the database table that meet those conditions. The scenario and use case in this demonstration involves a database with customer configuration and setup information stored in a table of change request records. The change request process involves querying for pending change requests, then performing operations based on the type and re of request and the data that's in each record. Administrators must be able to choose which changes to process for a selected customer. So the user input forms will be available for making those choices before proceeding. Some error handling and data validation will occur. And the final results must be available for audit or reference. And that's where supporting analysis will come in. Now let's move to the web console 
the operations console in Aegis 3.2, take a quick look at the interface, and then proceed to start a work item for this workflow. We have a nice interface in 3.2 that allows us to manipulate the screen and show more data in different sections than we used to be able to before. Down under my testing folder of processes on the left, I have the work item in particular that we're going to run. And it shows work items that have been run in whatever state that they're in. I can collapse and expand this to see more of the columns of information. Let me go ahead and start this work item and show you a little bit about the input forms as well since the prompts for those uh, come up in a couple of different places. There are now handy green arrow buttons to let you to start a process uh, from the screen. I'll do this for our SQL query workflow demonstration. Click the button yes to start a work item. I now have a work item tab that comes up and it starts with general attributes for the work item. I can see that it's in a running state. I can also see that up here at the top. And it has paused at the first input form. I can see that I have a submit input form button here up in the sort of status bar up at the top along with the ability to terminate or start another process. And at the bottom of the general attributes there's also a line for number of activities waiting for input. So if there's a form ready, you also have the button down here. Let me click on this so we can jump in and see what the first user input form is. Comes up with two menus. The first menu is a list of customers. This is actually pulled from a SQL query, so we'll see how to do that later. I'll just go with the first customer, Acme and then a setup type. Again, the data here is not as relevant as the fact that we can create the menus with data options. This particular menu has got two hard-coded options, basic and advanced for a type of customer setup. And I'll just go with basic. Click OK to submit the form. Let it proceed. You will notice the number of activities waiting for input has gone away. The form has been submitted. It's now processing. Sometimes this can happen real quick and we're already at our next input form. So let me click on that and move to the next input form. Now this is an input form that actually shows a table of data queried from the database. You can see that I can scroll over to see more data. It might also have more records. In this case there are only seven in the data set. You'll notice at the upper right corner there's a button that allows me to expand this. It isn't your standard Windows type of a button for maximize and restore, but this is what it looks like in the Aegis user interface, and it allows you to collapse and expand the user input form. So this is very useful for getting a maximized view if there's a lot of data to look through in here. In this scenario, we want to choose some of these change request items to process. So I'll just go through and select these. The first two columns here, E just pr provides for you. It gives a numbering of the records. This is not an ID from the database table you may be pulling from. This is merely Aegis's way of numbering the data that's been presented. So it just gives you a standard sequence. The second column is the ability to edit a table row. And there may be multiple edit options available. In this scenario, we only have one checkbox for us to choose which records we wish to process. When we click this, we now see that there's a checkbox in this select column. These items that are false actually represent an unchecked checkbox. I'll check this and I'll click update. Remember to click update if you have made changes to table records that have been presented in an input form like this. Otherwise, the changes do not go through. I will do the second one to demonstrate that. I'll check this and just move forward and you'll see that it's still false. It did not take my changes. Let me click a couple of these here and then submit. Notice that I didn't choose the second one. It had moved on without actually updating the change I made. There's a note up top in the description section that says it's important 
always check the config item type equals init. So I'm supposed to use this one. Uh, there's some data checking that we're doing on this that I will show you in a minute, but let's see what happens if I don't check it. So let me click to submit the form. And while that's going away, I'm going to change views. There's a workflow view that lets us actually see the sequence of activities, their completion status, and lets us get uh, output results and also see when there are input forms in the sequence that are waiting for input. I have a button up top that tells me there's an input form waiting, but now I can actually see it here. We also get our first look now at a sequence of activities. I've gone from this input form, cycled through here, and have actually gone through this error message activity and come back. So let me double click on this because this is what it looks like inside the workflow view when you have an input form waiting. I just double click it and it opens up the same form. I will maximize that. We now have an additional piece of information. Please select the item config item type equals init. So it's checking to make sure that I check this one. This is just for demonstration purposes. Obviously, if something was required, we would want to make that uh, always be selected. In this case, I'm just demonstrating that there's some uh, data validation going on. Now let me go ahead and select a couple of these to process. So I'll just make some selections here, making sure that I've included this one. And then I'll go ahead and submit the form. Now I can scroll down and we can see that it has moved through a middle section here where it's processing the selected SQL records. And we'll come back and take a look at this in the workflow designer to see how these activities are configured and take a closer look at this. But it has gone through. Here is a customer init sequence that copies some files and creates a timestamp that will then get recorded in one of the files that are copied uh, from one folder to another. Again, just a demonstration. And then there is also another route that has been processed here for another of the data records. We'll come back and look at this a little more closely when we get to the workflow designer. Now I'll proceed down. I can see what's been completed and I get to another input form. I knew that there would be an input form ready because we have submit input form highlighted as a button up here. You will notice it is not highlighted above the workflow view because this particular button depends on the selection that we have inside the workflow view. So if I click on the activity here, now it highlights this button here. This is always available up at the top. This one becomes highlighted when I click on the actual activity. Now this particular one is just a final confirmation. You can see here that I've more specifically shown where errors might have occurred in the processing. In this case it says no errors. So clearly we have an error section. Uh, the description section of an input form can be used to display error information if users have not made correct choices or they need to see an error before making an additional choice in a workflow depending on the complexity of the logic you're using. In this case, this is just a confirmation. We don't have any errors, and it's telling me to click OK to complete this. So let me do that. All right, now that this is complete, let's look at one more thing in the Web Operations Console, the Supporting Analysis tab. So above the set of views here, we have Supporting Analysis on the end. Supporting analysis is a place where we can display data that has been output in table form. And this comes from a variety of activities that output tables. Not all activities that output tables automatically can go to supporting analysis. We can use other activities to generate it if we need to. But the SQL activities allow us to send data straight to supporting analysis, and we'll look at later at the back-end configuration for that. In this workflow, there are two 
activities, SQL activities that output data, and we have configured those to send to supporting analysis. The hierarchy and the labeling of these folders is configurable. We'll see that. So we've designed this to show customer records, a particular customer's records, and then two outputs. The first one is the number of pending records that were queried. So those would be the number of change requests in this case. And if I click on that, it will show me the records that were output. This is the same data from which we were able to create the data in the input form that the user made selections in. Let me go ahead and collapse this section so I can expand and see this data more. You can see the records here. Again, the individual data fields is not that relevant. We have the customer's name. We have a status. So these were all open requests. They don't have a completion date, uh, nor are they recording the work item ID of the work item that processed and completed them, which we'll see in the next. Expand that. So in the processed, three of seven were selected by the user. And we have those three records here. They now have a status of complete, a completion date recorded, and the work item ID which is the current work item that completed the processing. So again, this is just a convenient place to display the output of SQL queries and table data. Now let's take a quick look at the configuration console and I only want to show one feature in here. In the options, which I can access from this button here, we have under configuration the global administrator settings. These are the global setting values, some of which are default in the application, some of the ones you see up at the top here. And then you have the ability to create new ones with information that you can use inside workflows. It allows you to create a global parameter that you can edit in the configuration console independent from any individual workflow but you'll be able to use that value across multiple workflows. So this makes it very easy for creating workflows that leverage a value and let administrators or end users change this value in here without having to create a new revision and edit a workflow. We will see a couple of the values used inside the workflow as we move into the workflow designer next. Now let's move to the workflow designer and let's look at a cloned revision of the current workflow in production. Cloning a revision when you want to just view some of the details is useful because in a view only revision such as one in production you are not able to really go into all of the activities and see all of the configuration so it's easier to use a clone uh, that's editable even if you don't wish to make changes. We're going to start with looking at the work item attributes that we have for this workflow. I'll double click on the background here to get into the workflow properties. Click on work item and we can see work item attributes. Just a few here. Uh, I've created some that we're going to see in some of the other activities but I want to point out these first two, the SQL server name and the database name uh, which are pulling from global settings that we just looked at. So when I set this up initially and I add these in, I'm using for the default value of this work item attribute, input builder. And in input builder, under new input element, you have global settings. So you're able to go in and add a global setting. And then you get to select from the list that we looked at previously in the configuration console. What that sets up for us is when the work item initiates, these will get populated right away from the global setting values because they're already available to the work item so nothing else needs to happen for those values to get uh, instantiated right away. These two values are being used in the SQL activities that you'll see and so we already will have the SQL server name and database name that we'll be referencing here. Now let's look at the first input form which gives us our two menus. We have a query that starts. It's a simple query, which I'll actually look at first. First, let's look quickly at the 
global settings values that are listed in here for the server name and the database name using input builder we have pulled the work item attributes that we saw populated by the global settings so this is just to tie these into the activities here this is where the SQL server name and database name values are added in and since these are being populated by the global settings values it is editable outside the workflow we set this up to perform a simple select distinct query from a database table we just want to get a list of the customers uh, for whom we have change requests the resulting table is then used actually one column of that table is used to populate a menu in this input form so in the input form let's go to edit what we have here in the input fields we have a drop down list for customer and if we look at the configuration of this we see that we've used the input builder for the list items and the item we have here is an activity output that pulls one of the table columns in this case in the output of the get customer list SQL activity the result of the SQL query outputs table data we check the box here to go in and configure the value and we take column one we could just as easily move through other columns and take the column of values to populate the list items for the menu I'll actually redo that from scratch so if I was to configure this I would check the box use input builder actually it's already got it in there let's add it again a new input element activity output parameter we scroll down we have get customer list result of SQL query there's the table we want not the output parameters the actual results that's the data set we check a box so that we can configure an individual column in this case we only want the one column that's output so the default is column one so that's really all that's required the other drop-down list menu is hard-coded where we manually add items here remember when you are adding values to a menu if you add them manually you have the ability to give it a label name this is what it will appear in the menu for the user and a value that you want returned uh, when, the when the form is submitted next we want to look at a query that uses information selected originally by the user and the output of that table is going to be used in an input form so the next two activities again a SQL activity and an input form uh, take us to the next level here in the get customer records activity we have a simple query but in this case our query does involve information from a work item attribute a work item attribute that was populated from the user's selection in the first input form so we have a simple query here selecting all from the configuration requests where the customer name is equal to and we have added the work item attribute for the customer name and we finish up the query so again we're just using some dynamic information in the middle of the query to pull uh, back a record set to work with let me also point out in this activity supporting analysis because this is one of our activities that does output to supporting analysis uh, let me go back to values for a second the send to supporting analysis item is checked when we want to send it to supporting analysis if it's by default it's unchecked so when we check that we're saying we want the output to go to supporting analysis and then we go to the supporting analysis location tab to configure the hierarchy of folders in which we want to see the data customer records is the top level and I'm using that in the other one anytime that you 
create one of these levels with the exact same name and you have multiple tables that output, uh, then they'll end up in the same part of the hierarchy so you can map things uh, directly to the hierarchy that you want depending on how much output you have in a given workflow. So customer records at first. The subfolder using the input builder is pulling again that customer name and in this case the title of the, the bottom folder before we get to the actual table will say pending so this is going to output the pending records uh, or pending change requests from the table that were queried. Now that we have our SQL data output we want to get that into the input form into a table make that table editable so a user can make selections from the output. Let me go in and edit to see this. There are actually two key things in here, one of which is the description field. Notice that in the description field, this is also using Input Builder, we have a message. This is the message that will show up for all of the forms, but there's also a work item attribute added for an error message. As long as this value is null, we won't see anything in the form. But if we do have an error, which we saw when we didn't select a particular value when we ran the work item, it then populates a message and routes us back to the form, and then that message shows up here. So this is a very convenient way to deliver error message information or other information based on any result that we want the user to see before viewing the data or making additional choices or changes into data that's available in the form. Moving to the input fields, this is where we pr create our table. We add table, and then we get our table properties dialog, which lets us go in and configure what we want from the table. First we configure the source table using Input Builder. We go to the Add Activity Output, in this case the Get Customer Records SQL Activity generates the SQL Query Table Output that we want. We don't have anything configured because we just want to point to the entire table. That's what we start with, the source table. Once we have the source table configured here, now we go in and decide which items we want. The very first item here is actually our checkbox. This is what makes this editable, or at least in this case, we have one editable column, and it's the checkbox. So we've added this as we would add a checkbox uh, on any kind of an input form, but because we're adding it as part of a set of table columns, it will end up being a checkbox for each row that's returned. Otherwise we configure it exactly the way we want. In this case I'm just calling it select. I'm giving it a minimum width and I can preset the default value. If I normally want all values to be checked then I would set the default value to true and that way the table that's populated for the user will all have records selected as true and chosen for processing, but the user would have the option to uncheck or exclude records. In this case, we're not pre-selecting any of them and the user will choose the ones that they want, but it could go either way. When we want to put the actual table columns here, we go in and we add a source table column. And in the dialog that appears, we give it a field ID, a display name, as we do for all sorts of input form items. We have the ability to identify the column by its index, so if we know column 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., we can just go by index, or we can go by column name. So if we are pretty familiar with the descriptive names for the columns, we can put that here. Then we have some additional options, which I am not using in this case but this will pull in the config item type column into the table that's displayed for the user. Same thing for each of these other columns. I don't have to pull all of the columns from the table. I can also identify some columns 
by their index number or by their name. You can mix and match. As long as they're all correctly identified, I can then move them up or down to sort the order of columns displayed for the user. So I've chosen four columns from the returned data set and I've added this checkbox in the beginning so the user will have the ability to edit. Any one of these can be made editable. So you'll see allow process operator to edit. So that was one of the configuration items I'm not using. This would allow them to make changes to the data that's displayed. So in this particular column we would make it an editable column and the user could update values in that column. Obviously that's only as good as what we do with the data afterwards. It doesn't automatically update a database. We now have an output set of data once they submit the form, but we have to go and do something with that data. That is not being done in this particular demonstration. We're just using the checkbox to allow the user to select which rows of data they want for further processing. Let me show one additional option in here. The final column that is added here, this request ID, is using one of the other options. You can see that this one is identified by its column index. It's actually the first column that's presented in the data set. I'm using it as the last column here, but I am identifying it by column one from the original data. The key thing here is this checkbox, hide in the operations console. So this means it's going to be hidden. The user will not see this column, but it will be in the data that's output. The user doesn't really need to see the record IDs that we are going to use but we'll want that request ID so that we can go back to the table to update the data. So that's a very important way to get table output uh, in front of users. It may just be for them to confirm, but in this case we can also make it editable, which we've done here. We've looked at the input form presenting the table to the user. They will have submitted a form with one or more records selected, and we need to get the selected records. We use an activity called search table for value, which I've renamed here to get user selected rows to be more descriptive. To configure this activity, we have a table input. We point to the output of our form. So in this case, we use activity output. The select configuration items to process is the activity that has the user form. And the customer records table is the table that's configured for the user, and it will now be the output table. So it will have all of the records output, but with any data changes that were made. In this case, only the checkbox was the editable column, so it will now have true or false depending on the user's selections. So we point to the table as our source. We then select which column we want to use to search for data values. We're going to return rows for which the data values are a certain value. Notice that it sets to zero and the description tells you that first column equals zero. So in this particular activity it's using array index numbering so that the first column actually starts with zero and that's confusing most of the activities when they're dealing with table columns start at 1, so column 1 is 1. But in this case it's 0, it does tell you that, but, but watch for that. We want to return all rows. We have the all rows or first row option. And then the cell value from column 0, the first column, we want to be true. So a checked box is a Boolean value that's either true or false. Uh, well, a checked box is true. Lowercase, true. The output from this activity will return a table. In this case, it will return a table of records for which the first column is true or checked. Now, what we're going to do is make sure. Here is where we have a little bit of data validation. We are doing the same thing from this output here. We're making sure that of the selected records, there is one for which the setup type is init or the config type is init so we had left a note for the user in the form saying that they needed to select that one we are now checking to make sure that that's the case so we have another of the same activities 
This one is the get user selected rows result, which is a table. In this case, it's not the first column, but the second column. So using a 1 here, so 0, 1 for the second column. We want the first row, or in this case any row, in which uh, we find init. So we want to make sure that they did check that init data record for processing. And as a result of that, we do a little conditional branching on this. So we want to make sure that the number of rows returned is 1. So if it's 0, we know that they didn't actually select the init item. We write a error message, which then shows back up in the form. If, in fact, the number of rows is equal to 1, they did select the init item, and we're ready to proceed. So we've just done a little data validation here. Next, we want to move into the loop section. And we know that we have an init value and one or more records selected from the user that we need to loop through and process per record and perform some data operations on each record. So let's start by looking at the configuration for the loop. We have several for each activities and the one that we are using here is for each table row which I have renamed here. Let me open this up and look at the configuration. I've renamed this one for each item to process. Basically there are records and each record is a configuration or a change request item to be processed in a certain way. Because this is a for each table row, it is looking for table input. So again, we point to a source table. In this case, the source table is the user selected rows result. So we went and looked for the rows that were true. And so the result table are the records that had true in that checkbox column. So we point to that as our table source. There really isn't that much to configure in this, we point to the table source, it will now loop through each of those records and the output of this activity, you can go look at activity parameters and you can see what the outputs are. There is an output table and in this case because we're looping through records, uh, that table is actually a row. So we'll have multiple columns, uh, well one or more columns, and each row will be presented so the data will be available here. So as we go through now, each of these loop iterations is going to present to us a table row. So we come out with a row or a record of data, and we want to populate that data into some work item attributes to be used. So it is a very good idea when you're going to be using data from tables or uh, anything in multiple, one or more other additional activities, it is very nice to put them into work item attributes to then use. One reason for that is it allows you to grab a conveniently named work item attribute. So you can see that these are named according to the column values or the column labels from the data set rather than uh, where they are in the activity outputs, which are a little bit more cumbersome to get to. So we do that once here, but then we can use them with their descriptive names and their work item attributes. The way we go and grab this we're using activity output again for each item to process is our loop activity and it outputs this table. It's a row, so it's a single row with one or more columns. We need to go tell it which column. So in this case we're going to get column 2 for this particular value. So we go through and we set up one cell even though it's a column, it's a row, so it's a single row, and we want the one cell from the particular column in there. So row one, which will always be the case uh, from the loop, and we go to the column that we want. So we can do this for each of these and pull columns two, three, four, and five, which are these values that we want to record for processing in this branch. Now that we have that data recorded in our nice uh, local variables or work item attributes, we can branch to different operations. The data processing here is less important than the fact that we can branch 
to perform different operations based on the data that we get in the record. So we use conditionals to determine whether we need to go down one sub-branch or another within the loop to perform the specific operation. So if it's init, config item type init, which we know that we required of the, cust of the user to enter, uh, we would go down this branch, copy files, record some dates, and then we, we proceed back to the loop. At the end of each of these operational sub-branches, we go to another SQL activity that updates the record in question. And we've recorded the ID of the record that comes with this data so that we can go back and update the record with uh, a status of complete, uh, the completion date, and the work item ID that we've used. And we saw that when we were looking at the work item in the web console, how that displayed and this is where we're making those updates to the database. So this is where we take data and we do go back to, to the database and make the change. The second branch is looking for a config item type equal to update. So if it's one of the update change request items then we would go down here. These icons or activities, the play button, the lightning bolt, and the check mark icon, these are no operation icons. They don't actually do anything. They are merely a way to provide some icon labeling to route through the flow of the workflow. So when you're going back to look at things, it's very obvious visually and labeled in a nice way to see what's being done. Uh, in this first section, we actually do have some operations that do manipulate some data. But in these, these are also no operations. So they're just placeholders for where you would build the logic necessary for a given workflow to work on the data from the record. Well, this is also good for initial development to lay out a workflow and begin to show where certain operations need to take place. So after we have looped through each of these records, performed operations, updated the table, we come back to the loop. When the loop is complete, and we have branches outside the loop. There's actually a return value from a loop activity or for each loop activity that is complete, whether that's true or false. And when complete is true, we can route away from this loop and proceed to the final section. For our final section, we will return to SQL, query the records that have a complete status for this particular customer and check to make sure that we had the right number of records. So we will use a conditional to compare the number of records that show a complete status against the number of records that were selected for processing. So again, a little bit of error control. And we do write a message, which will be available for the end user in a final confirmation input form before they close out. And then we do have another return to SQL, which in the demonstration is just a stored procedure, but we want to look at how you call a stored procedure using the SQL activity. So let's take another look at the SQL activity here. This activity is not only querying SQL, but as we can see down here, it is sending results to supporting analysis. So this is our second supporting analysis SQL activity. We're just executing a simple query. This is also just a select statement. We are using some dynamic information because we want to know all records where the status was complete and that show this work item ID. Since we are checking this box to send a supporting analysis, let's also look at the supporting analysis location tab here. We have customer records, so we're mapping to the same root level. The subfolder is using input builder to also get customer names, so again we want to map to the same level of the hierarchy. In Aegis supporting analysis, there are always three levels. So even if you don't really want to drill down that far, you do need to configure these. So using a common upper level mapping so everything goes to the same root and subroot levels will allow you to drill down. And then on this third level, if we really do need to break it out further, we can do so. And we've done that in this demonstration. We had pending records in the first case. Now we're using processed for our label, but we're using some dynamic information in here. We are pulling from an activity that's an echo activity that is just returning the number of 
result records that were selected by the user and we're intermixing this with some text so that we can create a nice message again just a good demonstration of using some dynamic information in Aegis for labeling in this case we're labeling it as an actual supporting analysis folder so it will say processed and in parentheses the number of records that they had selected of and then we get the total number of records that were originally available that were pending records queried from the database initially and they chose three so when we see the three of seven selected in the labeling the user will get an indication that if three of seven were selected and only two records show up in the table then they know that there was one missed and they'll be able to look at both the starting and the finish and, and be able to see which data was missing but we also write an error message as we check for that and make sure that the number of rows is the same here the input form at the end is very straightforward we're using the description field we are this time putting in a very obvious errors section labeling here and then we have this error message work item attribute the default value is no errors rather than being null so we will always see this down here but if we write an actual message into the errors uh, for a specific error that we receive then we can present it to the user here the final section after they've confirmed that everything is okay is to call the stored procedure now in an actual use case scenario there may be a need to call stored procedures within these looping branch operations or multiple times throughout the course of the workflow in this case we're just demonstrating it at the end and it's being used to reset the data records so that we can run the demo again and still have records that show a status of open let's take a closer look at this activity it's the same execute SQL command activity but in this case we are using the execute stored procedure operation rather than the execute query execute stored procedure has some specific syntax we want to point out here if it's a SQL server we just point to the name of the stored procedure so whatever stored procedure that we are calling we're already identifying the server name in the database uh, we just identify the stored procedure name here the values if it's a stored procedure that is taking parameter values we do a comma separated list of values here if you have a string value so in this case we're passing it the customer name and the work item ID so it can update the records for this customer with the completion status and date and also populate the work item ID and the stored procedure takes care of the rest of the SQL on the back end on the database but we're passing it the customer name which is a string value normally with SQL server and SQL string data you're putting that in single quotations Aegis will already do that for you so you do not want to use quotations in your string values here if there are spaces it's primarily looking at the comma separation to send information to the back end so it will single quote from one end to the other of the string before it meets the comma if you have commas within your string then you need to escape those commas with the backslash so that it knows the comma is part of the string so there's a little bit of syntax to be careful of when you're passing values to the stored procedure but otherwise you're just going to do a comma separated list and you'll configure the value with those parameter values the stored procedure name will go here if it's a stored procedure that does return data then you will need to, to do some additional processing that we're not demonstrating here for your output values and then the return type can be a single or a, re a result set type so you can get data back from a stored procedure also common uh, but not what be is being demonstrated here the last activity before the end is a simple command to delete the setup files that were copied into the customer folder again we're taking care of the file changes whereas the stored procedure is taking care of the data record changes so we reset back to the start point for the demonstration and then the workflow ends
Also notice that we have a capture workflow errors activity here so that any errors that occur can be captured and recorded. We aren't doing any special processing with errors. In a normal workflow situation, you would do more with the errors. At the very least, you would tend to send an email to an administrator with an error, but you might also take an error message and populate it into, into the input forms for the user so that they can see what the error is and make choices based on what that error may in fact be. So there's a lot of handling that can be done with the errors that we're not demonstrating here. That's the end of the workflow. Let's go back and take a look at the PowerPoint presentation and review a couple of the key points here. Again, the activities that were used that we looked at mostly. Execute SQL commands and scripts in the external execution library for those SQL activities. For the user input forms, email and user interaction library, collect input from user. For the loop, for each table row in the basic workflow control library, where we also have our no operation activity, very useful for uh, laying out routing and labeling in your workflow to make it easy to follow when you go back to edit or change or other users have to update or review the workflow. And finally in the data manipulation library search table for value is how we search for data values in a particular column to get a certain number of records from the table and that could be from SQL output or any of the activities that output table data. That is the end of this video presentation. I hope you've learned some useful ways to incorporate SQL query data into user input forms and process that data. Thank you.